The Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems is a project that is funded by USAID at the University of Florida. All of our efforts are geared towards improving the nutritional status and the health and the well-being of the poor. We're trying to improve animal production, processing and preservation of animal products, policies related to animal production, all because we want to improve the nutrition, the health, the incomes, and the livelihoods of the poor by sustainably intensifying livestock production in our local countries. Our countries were selected because they are Feed the Future countries. They also have considerable livestock resources, and yet the level of consumption of animal source foods, meat, milk, eggs, and even fish in these countries is very, very low. Let's take a look at a little bit deeper at what's happening. Undernourishment has really declined a lot, so that's very, very gratifying. This is over 20 years from about the early 90s to the early years of this decade. You can see that poverty, extreme poverty, is also declining, except in Africa it is not declining nearly as rapidly as we'd like to see. That map belies the situation because it's a measure of micronutrient undernutrition and deficiency is a measure of diet quality and you can see that the hot spots still sub-Saharan Africa and, and South Asia. Let me turn to some issues relating to food and nutritional security as it relates to the global context. Less than a third of the world are well fed and well nourished. So it's a very small percentage. As incomes rise, malnutrition and energy deficiency reduces. It's also related to income distribution within countries. Our interventions in livestock is to produce more and get more income and get more expenditure to buy food, to contribute more animal source food so we can diversify our diets and the compositions. Income, as I said, is very important and we're also starting to see good evidence that income from animal source enterprises are playing huge dividends. Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems organized a global nutrition symposium. The theme was nurturing development, improving nutrition through animal source food consumption. We organized this symposium for a number of reasons. First of all, we wanted to highlight the problem of undernutrition in the world. So about 45% of deaths of children across the world are caused by undernutrition. Undernutrition is the lack of nutrients in a diet, and we tend to measure it as wasting, stunting, or underweight, which are three different metrics of undernutrition. Stunting is measured by the height of a child and the age of a child. It's a metric that allows for understanding of chronic malnutrition. Pregnant, lactating women and children are the most vulnerable populations to stunting, and that has to do with those periods of time and and life that have acute development associated with them. So children under five, particularly children under two, are highly vulnerable to stunting. We know that the majority of stunting actually happens between the age of six and 18 months in a child's life. But during, of course, pregnancy, the woman is carrying the child and some malnutrition is in place and some stunting happens before the child is even born. Many of the countries where we work have very high levels of stunting. The governments of these countries have been doing a great job at trying to combat malnutrition and the levels of stunting are decreasing, but they are still quite high. We wanted to also address and highlight the evidence for the role of animal source foods in the diet, for improving nutrition, improving health, improving the growth of children, improving skeletal development, cognitive development, test scores. So there are all these different areas where animal source food consumption can really improve the lives, the livelihoods of people in poor countries who are malnourished. 
This is the global child malnutrition trends from 1990 to 2014. And on the left side, what you see is uh, essentially the rates of stunting have gone down. These are the absolute numbers, and this is the prevalence of stunting. It's gone down from about 250 million children to about 160 million. Still pretty high. We talk a lot about stunting in the first thousand days, and I think this slide is very illustrative of what is actually happening. Uh, I want you to focus on the blue line. This is essentially the marker of stunting, which is height for age Z score. And what this is is a plot of uh, children from one to five years of age. There's a lot of issues in early life, as well as in pregnancy, that are leading to fetal growth retardation. So this leads to the whole idea that we cannot just think about stunting as a phenomenon that is linear, it is actually cyclical. The first thousand days are a crucial window of opportunity in terms of um, maternal nutrition and this problem of hidden hunger where you have particular nutrients, and I'll say nutrients, I don't think it's only micro, I think it's also macronutrients that are lacking in people's diet. Animal source food is not just important for child growth and for stunting, although stunting is related to this, but it's crucial for brain development. The first thousand days are important for that, but the next 3,000 days are also important, and we cannot neglect other life phases where there's ongoing um, brain development. From a medical perspective, there is no issue to prevent every child from stunting. I think it's very important to have a lot of lessons learned from Europe and from the U.S., also to support countries in Africa as well as in Asia and Latin America from make the same mistakes. So in the context of Holland where we became the tallest people in the world, a couple of years ago it was very popular people to have a microbiotic diet, which is a principle like you know what you see with the vegans. And they they looked at a group of women and they followed up their kids over a period of a couple of years. The kids were stunted, but even worse so when they looked at cognitive development, these kids had a poor cognitive development. And these were women who were educated and had a very high income. This is calcium intake in young females in the UK. You can see the RNI for calcium rises very rapidly, particularly from the ages of about six up to mid-teens. And the top line is the intake of calcium. This is the average for the population. And so you can see, on average, we have a substantial negative calcium balance in this period between the ages of around 10 and 9, 18, 19, just in the period when bone elongation and bone mineral mass development is at the rap most rapid. This is one of the studies looking at the risk of um, osteoporotic fractures in females aged 50 or over, uh, and the association between the risk of that and childhood milk intake. When milk intake has fallen from approximately one serving per day down to less than one serving per week, the risk of uh, osteoporotic fracture is increased by about two and a half, nearly two and a half times. So we might well be storing up real problems for ourselves in the future. These animal source foods supply several nutrients which are either completely lacking in plant source foods or are more available in animal source foods. So first of all, protein is very important for growth. The protein quality in animal source foods is much higher than that in plants because the profile of amino acids in animal source foods is more comprehensive and more similar to that of human tissue protein. Vitamin A is also critical for vision and for immunity and animal source foods are a very good source Vitamin B12, uh, very, very important for cognitive development, for neurological development, not present in plant foods. And so there have been studies that have shown that providing sufficient vitamin B12 during pregnancy to women will affect the test scores of children later in life. And there have been studies that have shown that adding a little bit of meat or milk to the diet of children in schools have improved their test scores, have improved their exam performance, their leadership skills, and so on and so forth. So it's not only about growth, it's also about the neurological development, which can have huge impacts and implications on the lifetime productivity of children in the developing world. I've been doing a talk of this type for something like 25, 30 years 
and I'm still hearing people sort of saying, wow, animal source foods are good for nutrition. They're not only good for nutrition, they are absolutely the platform on which you should insist that there should be uh, investment in animal source foods, that people have a right to animal source foods, that animal source foods, number one, affect human function as in this cross-sectional analysis of what was happening in these three countries. The second point that I would make is without animal source foods, you cannot meet the nutrient requirements of populations. Number three, only animal source foods have really been shown to reduce stunting. Lipid-based nutrient supplements, micronutrient supplements and whatever have really not had much of an impact. And number four, Animal source foods is a way to provide better nutrition for the whole household throughout people's lives. Health is a major issue because if, if a child is well fed but is chronically sick, they will not benefit from the nutrients they're consuming. A woman's educational status becomes highly predictive of her child's health and nutritional status. So education efforts are part of nutrition efforts. Schools end up being places where school feeding programs happen. So in some parts of the world, schools are the best shot children have at getting what we call high value foods. So whether those are garden vegetables or whether it's animal source food products, schools may be the only option where a child has access to those. The objective of our study was to test the efficacy of eggs introduced early. And I want to also emphasize early. So quite often animal source foods, there might be the recommendation in countries to introduce it at a year, um, in part because of concerns about allergies. We introduced the eggs at six months. So the kids were enrolled six to nine months of age. And I think this was part of the difference that we made. It was a randomized control trial. The intervention was one egg per day for six months. We reduced stunting by 47%. One egg per day for six months. Animal source food consumption inherently um, is associated with some risks. So there are foodborne diseases associated with animal consumption, you know, different pathogens. We wanted to address those issues and look at ways in which we can tackle, prepare for, and address those risks. From a One Health perspective, where we think about animal health, human health, and the environment together, we begin to see that certain livestock share pathogens with humans more easily, and chickens share a lot of pathogens. And so zoonotic transmission of disease from chickens to humans, particularly children, is of keen interest right now to, to researchers around the world, and we as a global community have to be cognizant of those and do the research necessary to really begin discerning where is the risk, where is the benefit, and how do we weigh those odds. Environmental enteric dysfunction is a chronic inflammation of the gut. So the children do not show any visible signs of disease, but underlying there is a huge impact on their villi, which are blunted causing a reduced absorption of, of nutrients. So a lot of the nutrients that are ingested move out of the body rather than being absorbed. But also this leads to improved permeability of the intestines uh, to pathogens. So the path pathogens can become systemic. They will constantly challenge the immune system and a lot of the energy that a child has available to grow will actually be lost in fighting the infections rather than, than to grow. A recent review suggested that environmental enteric dysfunction may cause up to 40% of growth faltering of children in the developing world. Mycotoxins are the toxic and carcinogenic chemicals that are produced by fungi that colonize our food crops. Now, what people have asked me often is if livestock consume mycotoxins at high levels and then we consume the beef, the pork, the eggs, the milk, are we at any risk ourselves? And so that answer is twofold. The answer is no in most cases if we're consuming primarily muscle meat and eggs. Where there is a concern is if we consume milk from dairy animals that consume high levels of aflatoxin, and if we consume blood-related products from animals that have consumed high levels of ogratoxin A. You know, do all these things through empowering women because there's plenty of evidence and data to suggest that um, 
development outcome and well-being is enhanced dramatically when you empower women in the household. How can we listen to all this and still promote the idea that a diet without animal source food is an acceptable diet? And I think that's a really fundamental question. We want to use the best information available, and, and I heard a lot of compelling information today. We just completed a review of our portfolio of investment in, in livestock, and it shows that over the past 15 years, uh, there is a, a steady increase of, uh, of investments. We, we are facing now uh, a huge demand uh, from, the, uh, from the countries for investment in, uh, in, in livestock and livestock projects, which is really good news. The last reason why we wanted to hold this symposium was to bring together the major players who are funding research for development and development efforts, who are trying to improve the consumption of animal source foods in different countries. We wanted to bring them together to give them an opportunity to uh, discuss their different interventions and how to synergize the different activities for greater impact. The next steps for us are to try to see what we can do to increase the scope and impact of our activities. So it's an opportune moment in time for the Livestock Innovation Lab because there really is so much happening in science that is better informing us so that we can understand those linkages that are there between livestock and human health, but also the gaps and that's the role that the innovation lab can play is we we are taking a one health approach we're a team of scientists and researchers and development practitioners who understand how inextricably linked human health is to environmental health to animal health and so the time is right because the gaps are there as an entity that's charged with research for development it's a real moment in time of opportunity for us and we're excited to see what happens in the future